Welcome to Creating a World of Women of Significance on Global Voice Radio with your host, Margie O'Kane. Listen and learn how you can create a legacy for women and girls around the world. Women of Significance can change the world. Here is your host, Margie O'Kane. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm your host, Margie O'Kane coming to you via Global Voice Radio. My shows are all about expanding qualities undeveloped within you, unleashing your potential and continuously improving self. A blueprint for a life of significance. A guide to continuously retune your life. Before I begin, I want to thank and acknowledge all those wise giants whose teachings I have discovered. What I share with you would not be possible without my self-discovery journey. I have read over 3,000 books on self-improvement, attended lit seminars, studied various modalities, psychology and leadership programs, spent thousands of dollars on mentors and my studies. My background is client-centered care and I have worked as a registered nurse and midwife and a consultant for over 50 years as a manager and a director of nursing. I'm a skilled auditor in many quality standards and NLP trainer and grief counsellor. My talks are outtakes of what I have learnt, what I believe to work and my personal experiences of life and of dealings with people in leadership positions. Previously, we have spoken about what is significance, why significance and self-esteem your personal vision and values, and how your thoughts and words govern you. In this episode, we're going to talk a little about what motivates you. If you Google self-motivation, there is a sway of information, academic writings and research papers. However, today I will tell you what works for me. Motivation is simply the reason you have for wanting to do something. It's the drive you have to work towards your goals, put effort into self-development and achieve personal fulfillment. It's important to note here that self-motivation is generally driven by intrinsic motivation or the motivation to achieve that comes from sincerely wanting to achieve and desiring the inherent rewards associated. It can also be driven by extrinsic motivation the drive to achieve that comes from wanting the external rewards, like money, power, status or recognition. Although it's clear that intrinsic motivation is usually a more effective and fulfilling drive. A compelling reason will propel you into taking the necessary action as well as sustain you when things get tough or the goal isn't easy to achieve as you thought. A lukewarm reason will allow you to give up early or lose momentum when things get difficult. For that reason, a compelling why is your best prerequisite for success in any undertaking. A compelling why is the reason an alcoholic can hit rock bottom and then turn his life around. A small framed mother can find the strength to lift a car off her injured child. A bankrupt businessman can go on to build a business empire. A neglected orphan can master a craft and achieve international fame. So why do you want what you want? People are motivated by both pleasure and pain. Some people are motivated by the promise of rewards. They move towards a goal. Other people are motivated by a fear of failure or loss. They move away from a negative situation. Financial freedom can be achieved through either type of motivation. Which one applies to you? For each goal that you write, ask yourself these questions. What pain prevents me from acting? It may be the discomfort of stepping outside your comfort zone. What pleasure do I get from not acting? Perhaps it's the relief of avoiding discomfort. What benefits will I get from acting? 
Is your goal exciting enough? What will it cost me if I don't act? What will you lose if you stay where you are now? Remember, for each important goal, you need to write down 10 reasons why you must change and write down 10 reasons why you can change. Include both benefits and costs. The benefits are what you'll get if you achieve or don't achieve your goal. The costs are what you'll lose if you achieve or don't achieve your goal. To help you assess these, do the following process. There's an NLP technique called future pacing. That's a simple way to look at the consequences of your actions. Anthony Robbins calls it the rocking chair test. Imagine yourself much older, sitting in your rocking chair and looking back over your life. Imagine if you had not achieved your goal. How would you feel? Experience the pain of loss. Imagine if you had achieved the goal. How would you feel? Experience the pleasure of success. Write down why you need to achieve your goal and place it somewhere where you'll see it every day. According to emotional intelligence expert Daniel Coleman, self-motivation is a key component of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is the measure of an individual's ability to recognize and manage their emotions and the emotions of other people. The placement of self-motivation within emotional intelligence highlights its role within our ability to understand ourselves, relate to others, and to succeed in reaching our goals. Goldman states there are four components of motivation. One, achievement drive or the personal drive to achieve, improve and meet certain standards. Two, commitment to your own personal goals. Three, initiative or the readiness to act on opportunities and optimism. The tendency to look ahead and persevere with the belief that you can reach your goals. Self-motivation is easy to understand when you consider some examples. A person who goes to work every day just to pay the bills, keep his family off the back and, and please their boss is not self-motivated. While a person who needs no external forces to make their trek into work every day and finds fulfilment in what they do is self-motivated. The student who only completes her homework when her parents remind her, nag her or ground her for failure to complete is not self-motivated. But the student who completes her homework with no prodding because she wants to learn and succeed in school is self-motivated. The woman who only goes to the gym when her friends drag her there or because her doctor is adamant that she needs to exercise to get healthy again, again, is not self-motivated. But the woman who sets an early alarm and schedules her time to get to the gym, whether everyone, anyone encourages her or not, is self-motivated. As you can see, self-motivation is all about where your drive comes from. If your motivation comes from within and pushes you to achieve for your own personal reasons, it can be considered self-motivation. If you are only motivated to achieve standards set by someone else and not for your own internal satisfaction, you are probably not self-motivated. It's possible to be self-motivated in some areas of your life and not in others. For example, in the first, for example, the persons in the first example is not in, internally motivated to go to work, but is make, but is sure to make time for his marathon running or training. They are not self motivated when it comes to work, but certainly they are self motivated regarding the training. As you have likely guessed already, self motivation is an important concept. While we are certainly capable of getting things done to please others and meet external standards, these efforts are not what we'd call a labour of love. In other words, doing things because we feel we must do them or to gain some external reward is enough to, in many cases, but it doesn't invoke the passion that drives innovation and excellence. It's fine to use external sources to motivate you in some areas, 
But if you're not doing anything that's self-motivated, you are unlikely to feel personally fulfilled and to find deeper meaning in your life. Not only do we generally do better work when we are self-motivated, we are also better able to cope with stress and simply happier when we are doing what we want to be doing. There is an ongoing discussion on creating motivation and how to mot motivate an employee to perform faster or how to motivate children to do their homework or clean up their room. There's plenty of programs offering a solution to motivation or motivational speakers that promise to entice or motivate their audience. NLP is working with something that is called meta-programs. For the sake of more human language, let's call it mental filters. These mental filters describe how we see and experience the world around us. Meta-programs are the human mental filter that run our brain. These programs run in every area of our life and change according to the context in which we operate. Examples for context are like driving a car or working on a project or joining a company. As I mentioned earlier, have you ever wondered why someone is constantly motivated by reaching goals when another person is only motivated by fear? This is just one expression of those motivational filters. And in the context of NLP, they are called towards, towards to and away from programs. It's a bit like the carrot and the stick approach. Away from describes how everybody wants to avoid problems or identifies challenges or problems ahead. With toward to, someone is driven by goals and solutions. I am very much toward to in learning things and developing training programs or dealing with clients. However, I'm away from when it comes to paperwork. I simply don't like it and I prefer someone to do it for me. Suitable goal setting actually involves both. Have you ever wondered why your goal setting doesn't really work? Maybe it is because you don't feel the pain enough and only describe what you want to achieve. Or you just describe what you don't like and forget to outline the positive outcome of your goal. There are plenty of more meta-programs or filters in our mind that constantly run and determine how we see and interact with the world and how we keep our motivation going once we are motivated. There are various tests to identify the patterns or filters in your mind. I encourage you to complete one, to find it wonderful. I find it wonderful to learn more about me. So how do you motivate someone? First, we must remove the notion or the illusion that we motivate anyone. Everyone motivates themselves or does not. They will either act or will not, based on their assessment of the situation and the evaluation of their options. We cannot forcibly get anyone to do anything that they sometimes, that they themselves do not evaluate consent to and act towards. And everybody is perfectly motivated. This may sound a bit strange, given the fact that we could probably all think of at least one person we know who seems to have little or no motivation. But it's true. Here's how it works. If a person is lying on a couch, watching TV and eating potato chips, they are just as motivated as the so-called workaholic. The person lying on the couch perceives doing nothing as leading to pleasure and relaxation, and the lack of effort equals ultimate pleasure. The workaholic works 12 hours days, days because he or she believes that the money earned will allow them to one day lie on the couch and do nothing in luxury later, perhaps for a longer period. Or the workaholic may feel that hard work equals power, pride or money all on which he or she equates to ultimate pleasure. So the person on the couch is seeking pleasure, as is the workaholic. They are just using two different strategies to get to the same goal, which is pleasure. 
The proof of this lies in the fact that if you remove the imagined motivator, i.e. money, power or pride, from the workaholic, you would probably very soon see them lying on a couch somewhere trying to get back into a state of pleasure. Both are chasing pleasure, but they have chosen two different ways to try and accomplish it. This demonstrates that everyone is perfectly motivated and that if we wish to properly motivate them in treatment, we need to learn what their motivators are. I found when I introduced change in the hospitals I worked in, I spoke with one-on-one -on -one or in small groups to understand their motivation strategy and uncover the WIFM factor, what's in it for me factor or their pleasure factor. And I also discovered people need to hear about the change seven times before they take ownership. This slowly eliminates their pain. Each person has different belief systems, motivators and strategies for getting their needs met. The quickest way to uncover their strategy, strategy is to listen to them speak and watch for clues as to whether they are primarily using a push or pull strategy. This process can also be quickened using questions. Have the person think back to a past accomplishment that they feel great about and ask them how they accomplished it. Then ask them what they were afraid of as they tried to achieve this accomplishment to find the push strategy and explore with them to note how each fear works conceptually. Move on and ask them what they pictured and what excited them as they moved towards this goal. Also ask them what excited them about this goal and how did they feel when they achieved it. It's a pull strategy. Note conceptually the type of pleasure they are motivated toward. Then, to gain additional information and fill in any holes, ask them why it was so important for them to achieve the goal. If you don't like this question and answer model, you may, be more, you may more subtly, subtly pick up their strategies by listening to their patterns in common conversation. For example, if you hear a person speaking with apprehension about being fired when it is unlikely, this person is probably sharing his or her moving away from strategy, which is fear. Or if you hear a person sharing concern as to whether he or she will get important promotion, they are giving you clues that they may have a strong pull strategy moving towards gain. Look for a common thread to their interpretations of situations to find their primary strategy. Once you have their primary strategy, you can begin to use it as your primary motivation strategy with this person to create improvement. For example, if you are treating an addict who has a push strategy, bringing to his attention all the negatives that would befall him if he doesn't take suggestions and how bad he would feel, if the addict has a pull strategy, talk to him about how taking the suggestions would improve his family situation, job status, and overall health and happiness. The key to motivation to reaching the other person is to use their strategies for motivation, not yours. What works for you does not work for all. This is a great truth. Your challenge is to step outside yourself and work with the other person's thought patterns not to have the person adjust to doing things your way. This ability to match and shape the person's strategies and thought patterns is the hallmark of a good influencer or motivator. Can you become more motivated? I believe so. Self-motivation is driven by a set of skills that are within your control. There are six things you can do to maintain your self-motivation. Continue learning and acquiring knowledge. Develop time or spend time with enthusiastic and supportive people. Cultivate a positive mindset and work on your optimism and resilience. Identify your strengths and weaknesses and work on them. Avoid procrastination and, your work, on your, and work on your time management skills. Get help when you need it and be willing to help others succeed.
The research on self-motivation clarifies its vital role in helping us to achieve our goals. While self-discipline and self-motivation are two distinct concepts, self-discipline is vital to maintaining self-motivation. It's not enough to simply be self-motivated. To achieve your goals, you need to, uh, to couple self-motivation with self-discipline. A study of online learners showed that even though they might all be considered self-motivated, since they're all taking a voluntary course with the goal of learning, those with self-discipline were most likely to succeed. Those who were highly self-disciplined displayed higher competence at the end of the course, fulfilled more external tasks and were more effective in achieving their goals. One of the primary unconscious functions of the human mind is releasing on demand enough levels of self-motivation. Your mind, through your vision, creates and produces enthusiasm, courage, persistence, and most importantly, creativity. To the degree there is a contrast between how we are performing now and how we envision ourselves performing motivation before performing motivation. This is an automatic and natural effect. It flows whether you want it to or not. This is a natural ongoing process. You are either aware of this amazing power and manage it to produce your intended results or you allow it to run rampant, amuck and aimless, usually at a little more than idle speed, chasing its tail in a vicious cycle of mediocrity. But the fact is, your mind does produce this effect for you. Your script is already in place. It's even self-monitoring. The following statement communicates this as best I can. To the degree that there is a contrast between what we have decided should be happening, visions, and what is happening, current results, motivation naturally, effortlessly, powerfully, and infinitely flows. It does this instantly, as soon as it recognises recognizes that a contrast exists. The best analogy for this, how this works is a thermostat. Let's say the actual temperature, what is happening in your current results, is 65 degrees, and you set the thermostat at 70 degrees, 70 degrees, what you've decided should be happening on your goal. There is a contrast between them. So the thermostat signals the heat of, to produce heat motivation until the temperature hits 70, 70 degrees, at which time the thermostat signals the heater to stop. The temperature in the room starts to cool back down almost immediately. When it drops below 70 degrees, motivation begins to flow and the warming up process begins again. Back and forth, back and forth, the temperature rises and falls, constantly in search of the 70 degrees. Thank you, Bob Proctor, for that little demonstration. So too, when what is happening in your life contrasts with what you decide should be happening, the thermostat in your mind releases motivation to bring the two together to create alignment. As the two come together, motivation is moment momentarily, momentarily reduced, only firing up again when they drift apart. If there is no difference between what is going on and what you expect to go on, you may not be motivated. There is nothing for your mind to pursue. You have no need for physical energy, enthusiasm, courage, persistence or creativity. You are, in a word, apathetic. Some people call it lazy, others bored. Lost souls in the sea of humanity. Victims of their own mind crimes. Lemmings leading themselves off the cliff of resignation, despair, hopelessness. Your mind doesn't care about what you want or what you're willing to work hard for. It only cares that you perform in accordance with what you expect for yourself. If that requires an adjustment up or down, one step forward or two steps back, your mind doesn't care. It's like a script that is already in place.
The book, Don't Worry But Think Happy, was about, it's about starring in and directing and producing the movie of your life with powerful results. It's about taking your desires, hopes, dreams and aspirations and turning them into roaring fires of accomplishment. And it's also about how to do this all by yourself, anywhere you want, anytime you choose for the rest of your life. However, this book is not about achieving anything you've ever wanted. That's not a place you would ever want to get to, not that you ever could. For along with having anything, any, everything you want, comes apathy. This book is simply about accelerating the momentum of your every successes for the rest of your life. People are happiest, happiest when they are in process of achieving. When they're accomplishing something that is tremendously important to them. It's the anticipation of getting the intended result, knowing you're on the right track, moving forward in momentum that makes you the happiness. Do you remember when you bought your first car? Do you remember how you felt in the weeks, days and hours leading up to the purchase? Creativity is not the exclusive property of genius. Creativity or creative thought is a direct result of being motivated. We can all generate create, creative, creative thoughts whatever and whatever we want. So whenever and wherever we want. This tra tra the same is true for physical energy, courage, enthusiasm and persistence. These energies and decision-making abilities are available to us on demand in extraordinary quantities. Our emotional state and our state of mind determine when and how we unleash them. Take a moment to reflect on the times in your life when you have called on them and they were there. So too, when what is happening in your life contrasts with what you decide should be happening, the thermostat in your mind releases motivation to bring the two together to create alignment. As the two come together, motivation is momentarily, momentarily reduced, only firing up again as they drift apart. Some techniques and exercises are more difficult than others. If you're looking for a quick and easy exercise or activity to boost your motivation, try these. Listen to motivational music like Bill Conti's Gonna Fly Now, Paul Engelman's Push to the Limit, Queen's We Will Rock You, Kenny Loggins' Danger Zone, ACDC's Thunderstruck. Watch a motivational movie like Forrest Gump, The Pursuit of Happiness, Life is Beautiful, Rain Man, The Family Man. Read books that boast, boost motivation from authors like Napoleon Hill, Brian Tracy, Tony Robbins, Jim Rowan. If you need something a bit stronger, try these techniques. Set wisely chosen and deeply personal goals, which you are excited about and working towards. Schedule rewards for yourself and when you accomplish your goals or step towards your goals for the larger ones, visualize yourself achieving and fulfilling these goals. Create a vision board with your goals, aims and dreams in mind and post it somewhere where you'll see it often. T pay attention to your hierarchy of needs, a la Abraham Maslow. Ensure you are meeting your lower level needs, including physiological needs like food and sleep, safety needs, social needs and esteem needs. Use NLP to understand human experience and motivation. Envision what could happen when you reach your goals, as well as what could happen when you fail to reach those goals. Incorporate things you are interested in and engage in your curiosity when sitting and working towards your goals. Make a commitment to someone or something to ensure you, you, your future self will find it difficult to change plans or put things off. Building self-efficiency is one of the best ways to develop your self-motivation. It might sound difficult or complex, 
but there are three simple step activities you can do to help you get there. Ensure early successes by choosing activities or steps that you know you can do. Watch others succeed in the activity you want to try. This is particularly effective if the person you're observing is similar to you or close to you. Find a supportive voice like a coach, counsellor, friendly manager or mentor to encourage you, encourage you and give you feedback. Use movement to pump yourself up. It's tough to feel motivated when you're sitting idly in a corner. Instead, stand up, move around and pump yourself up. Show more excitement and motivation in your movements and you'll become more motivated. Studies have shown that physical movement affect our mental state. So when you don't feel motivated, get moving, make a fist and pump yourself up. Make use of pain, pain and pleasure. One of the best ways to get yourself motivated is to make sure you use pain and pleasure. How do you do this? Easily. Associate massive pain to not acting and massive pleasure to acting. So whenever you think of not acting, for example, not ex exercising, associate painful things like becoming fat, lacking energy, looking ugly, body getting weaker, etc., etc. Then associate pleasurable things like looking good, feeling energetic, etc. The more painful dash pleasurable and the more intense you make it, the more effective it becomes. Intensify the pain or pleasure associations by getting your emotions involved and by thinking of the impact of taking action, not taking action over a long period of time. Such as all the pain you will get for the next 20 years if you don't act now. Make use of rewards. Another way is, of course, to use motivation and rewards. As they say, when something is at stake, when there is a reward involved, everything changes. Make a pact with yourself and set some form of rewards for motivation. Many NLP techniques and teachings are perfect for boosting motivation anytime, anywhere. Learn more and make use of this body of knowledge because it is powerful, fast and most importantly, effective. Have variety in your environment. The environment you're in can have a big influence on your motivational levels as well. First, make it conducive as possible. The less distractions around, the better. Let's face it, it is harder to be more motivated to act when you're lying in your bed. Secondly, make it a point to add variety to your environment if possible. Occasionally change the location, use another room in the house, head to the library, a quiet cafe, or go to the park, etc. When things are fresh, you keep the interest up and thus the motivation levels as well. Using music is a great self-motivation technique. Prepare a CD or playlist of uplifting motivational music and keep it nearby so that it'll come in handy when you need it. You can play the music in the background while acting or first listen intently to the music, feeling its motivational quality. And while listening intensely, visualize yourself being motivated, acting and reaping the rewards from your action. I feel that movie, music, movie themes are a great source for suitable motivational music. Combine motivation and goal setting to get maximum, maximize your results. Goal setting can increase motivation because it intensifies or identifies our goals in detail and, it, and externalizes the target. With it, we have a more complete perspective of what we are aiming for. As Nike said, just do it. Take a small action first, any small action. Often the first step is the hardest, but once you get yourself going, you will gain momentum. So just do something first. Start off by doing something easy. You'll realise that once that happens, you'll naturally follow through and do more and more. Get the ball rolling fast. Get the ball rolling first, rather. Once this happens, the rest will be easy. Get curious and interested. 
it's only natural that we feel more motivated to do things that we're interested in. If you dislike flowers and plants, it would be tough to get you motivated about gardening. To counter this, try adopting a curious attitude towards the very thing that you are not interested in. If you get curious enough, you can turn anything interesting. You are an infinite storehouse of enthusiasm. You are an infinite storehouse of courage. You are an infinite storehouse of persistence. You are an infinite storehouse of creative genius. Final thoughts. Like many things, motivation is born out of a habit as well. The longer you can keep something up, the closer it is to becoming a natural habit. Make being motivated a habit using these self-motivation motivational techniques. What's your take on self-motivation? What works best for you? Do you find yourself motivated more by external rewards or by internal drives? Do you find that your motivation differs in different areas of your life? Let me know your thoughts. Thank you for listening and good luck with self-motivating. Remember, it's not your success that matters, but your significance. Reach out to me at margie at margieokane.com. Again, thank you for listening. See you for the next in the series of A Blueprint for a Life of Significance, A Guide to Continuously Retune Your Life. Margie O'Kane, signing off. Thank you for listening. Join Margie O'Kane, host of Creating a World of Women of Significance, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern on Global Voice Radio, where your voice is heard.